Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Udika Tuesday number 254. Tonight, uh, we are in the company of Emanuel Christ on behalf of his office, Christian Gantenbein, who came all the way from Basel. So thank you so, so much for coming. Upon invitation from Professor Subuchano, uh, we are extremely interested to hear what you're about to show us. As always, we are also delighted to have a discussion with all of you, which will be started by some students of, of our first year. Of course, you can also ask questions in the YouTube live chat or also on our Telegram channel. And with this, I will hand over the word for a short introduction. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Helene. And especially thank you very much to Emmanuel Christ for coming here today. Uh, I mean, it's a real pleasure to have him here. Uh, you probably all of you know who he is. He is an architect uh, from Basel. He he was studying in the um, ETH uh, in Zurich and and by the way in the UDK Berlin. That means that maybe some of you didn't know that he was here as he was commenting me recently uh, some one semester or one year I don't know several years ago nevertheless and so he's an old acquaintance of uh, of this university. Yeah, uh, he. Um, as um, as you probably know, he has he granted his office uh, called Christian Gandenbein together with his partner Christoph Gandenbein. Uh, I don't know exactly when, but at the end of the 90s, yeah, as far as as I remember to read, and um, and this is a very interesting thing because they have become, uh, and this is uh, a fact, uh, one of the most interesting European offices nowadays. I mean, they and 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 it is somehow. Uh, connected in a way, that in the way that they started to work, uh, I guess, at the beginning of this century, in which um, there was uh, a great opportunity to really, to really work in architecture, I tell you from my own experience, even though I started before. Uh, and that means that um, I, I understand that they started to, to test and build their own architectural uh, ideas soon and that uh, led them to 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 develop and to design and to build very very interesting works that we all know i mean i'm thinking now in the kunst um, museum in basel that we visited very recently with our students uh, or the swiss national ba uh, national museum or nowadays and this is something he i know he's doing and uh, the museum in barcelona the magma barcelona together with h architects who is another of office of the of the level i'm mentioning now and were invited here by us some years ago if you might remember i think the work of um, of Christian Gandenbaim is extremely interesting in the in the contemporary scene, uh, uh, in the sense that they are dealing with, uh, as you can imagine, questions that are in the architectural debate that have to do with uh, context and city and sustainability and uh, all the questions that are in discussion, but it, from a very personal. Uh, uh, point of view. I mean, we are used to have here, and this is a reason of the Udeka Tuesday's uh, lectures, architects from different places of the world, but mainly of Europe, and in the last years from France, uh, months, I would say, uh, France and Spain and Belgium and Germany, and each of them ap approaches uh, these questions from a different point of view. And I think the work of uh, Christian Gandenbein is very, very much connected to this um, interest in the context, in the place, in construction, in the quality of the architectural work uh, from the idea, uh, uh, and therefore at the end dealing with, I, I would say, the core questions of architecture. And this is, I would say, a personal opinion that I transmit to my students and, uh, and that I'm happy to talk about questions that have to do with handling of the space and natural light and material and precision and construction and inter integration in the historical context. Many of their projects have been extensions of uh, existing uh, museums or other works, Yeah, which mean or translate, and we are going to see uh, this uh, into a sort of a dialogue between the new and the existing, or a conversation between both, that I find in the very core of, of, of the architectural work. So I will leave it here. I, I, I would mention only, uh, because it's an, an important question, that um, 
Emmanuel Christ has been connected to the academic world uh, uh, since the beginning. He's now a full professor in the ETH in Zurich. He has been teaching in other places like Harvard and other um, prestigious places in the world. Uh, so uh, we are really very, very glad to have you here and look forward to listening to you. Thank you. Hi. is maybe better all right okay so thank you enrique thanks everybody for inviting me and also thank you for the introduction it's so the theoretical part is already done so um i i feel uh, pretty much relieved however it's a, it's a, as it has been mentioned this is um Quite a, mean, a meaningful appearance, not necessarily for you, but for myself, since I have these memories of being a student here at the Hardeka, as it was called at the time. I don't tell you except, but I think it's like 27 years or something, so mid mid 90s perhaps. And um, <laughs> and now I thought, and now I'll show you what I've done since. So uh, it might be a bit long. So and please just raise your hands up, make me move forward. However, I, I speak about, yes, our office, there is also an academic practice, if I may call it like that. Uh, um, but uh, our studio is based in Basel. Uh, this is just, I mean, behind the crest of myself, this is, the, it's not everybody, and, uh, uh, but it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a great team of architects from different places in the world. This is a part of the, mo most of the people in Basel. We have a small office in Barcelona. And um, so this community is is behind what I'm, I'm sharing with you. And um, I'm very grateful for the collaboration with everybody, our partners and associates and all the architects, students, and who is helping to make our projects evolve. I have a very unmodest title for my for my lecture, and um, uh, <laughs> this is uh, the architecture of the city. Is, as you all know, in the first place, the title of a very famous book. It is published by Aldo Rossi in 1966, and uh, again and again, we are maybe not necessarily looking to the book. Uh, or back to the text exactly because it's very hard to read but this is just a, um, a, a side note but it's a, a very uh, important moment a book in a moment where the modernist period comes to an end as as we all know and what i believe again and again e even today is is quite relevant that it is written in a moment uh, when a new generation is somehow rediscovering and reconquering the city a new interest in existing buildings, in the buildings, so the physical uh, presence of the urban environment, the interest in the historic fabric. And you can guess why I am referring to that. We are maybe in a completely different, but still in a similar condition today. So without uh, going too much into the, the general uh, theory about Rossi, but we um, I think, remember that his take on the urban, on the city, is describing the city and its buildings as a cultural collective artifact. Mm -hmm. So they are so-called urban artifacts. And what also happens with that moment of describing the city the way Aldo Rossi does it, he's maybe not the only one, but for sure the most poetic one to introduce uh, the notion of time related to that physical presence of the city. So there is the notion, or there is maybe then a negotiation between permanence and um, and that change, right? Uh, and a second important or third important element of that of that very um, schematic, uh, um, uh, let's say, uh, description that I'm making here is that 
also uh, in in this way looking at the city we look at the distinction or the differentiation between the monuments or the shared collective public buildings and the ordinary buildings the normal case the mass of the city right? and I'm asking myself, why I, am I referring to Rossi? And I think it has to do very simply with the fact that maybe my teachers and the generation before us was directly influenced by Rossi. So we are probably, and I'm speaking of my generation, the grandchildren, uh, so to say, of, of, of Rossi and, and, and his generation. But what has stayed with us, even though the world has dramatically changed and is constantly dramatically changing, is that for us in in my practice in my personal experience it is still the european city that is the main reference or the framework in which we are in which we are acting and this is also again what i think is very precisely described in in in, in um, treaties like the one by rossi that's perhaps also why i'm allowing myself to refer to that monumental title However, I already mentioned in a way. Yep. No, no, no. It's okay. It's it's still good. Uh, it's um, I'm I'm looking at my notes. So there is a note, as you can see. But no, no. Thanks for um, already first signs of impatience. I understand. But I'm I'm trying to I'm trying to speed up. All right. Okay. Anyway. But okay. No. So. I stop it here. It will not be about my biography now, uh, neither about Rossi further on, uh, maybe. And I will speak about our work, actually. Uh, you will see that in a second. Um, but still, to make it explicit, I was referring to it. Uh, and, and I believe this is maybe the only uh, initial or introductory um, 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 thought that I would like to share is, I think we are today in a certain way in a similar situation um, to Rossi and the postmodern I mean, we are the post postmodern age, but um, what we observe, and still there is now a paradigm shift happening, but still there is a crazy fast speed of demolishing and reconstructing our, our territory. Entire cities are still being sort of completely taken over by, by, by rebuilding. Depends a bit on what cities we're looking at, of course, and um, I believe, and that's maybe the parallel, we have to fundamentally refocus on that, what already exists. So that's the notion of context, but I would refer to the notion of context at large. So not just where a building stands and where the angle is, etc. And so to make it a bold statement, I think we must reconsider the way we build our cities and ultimately uh, how we deal um, with our planet. So speaking of the city of the historic fabric the handed down um, legacy and heritage is actually uh, related to a social and i believe environmental uh, urgency that is obviously there so the strategies to which then i would come are called as i guess everybody understands in german and in english it's called adaptive or reuse simply so reuse transformation and also densification and a good part and um, now it works uh, we move forward reuse transformation and densification as a very general claim perhaps a bit too general and still i would like to uh, to um, invite you to relate to these topics also when we um, make it then to some uh, moments of, of discussion, which is a tricky thing because there are three um, 13 projects, but it can go fast. 13 projects that are all related to the architecture of the city in the context of, of um, the European, um, uh, let's say in the European continent here in Europe. Um, uh, 13 projects and another short introduction. But because uh, uh, very quick, it's I said our system of reference is the European city. Uh, it's actually not fully true. Um, in order to learn more and to widen our horizon, and in order to understand that already before mentioned relationship between a city and its buildings, we started a big research project that's now less in our practice in the studio. It's at ETH, where I have been teaching um, 
over long years in the meantime, which I think is still a very inspiring uh, and, and great privilege to, to do, to teach and also to do research. And, um, and we started our own, let's say, scientific um, a, a project, which is something like a very grand tour. So we do, did not only um, um, travel to Italy and, 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 and Greece, but also to Hong Kong and to, to other big cities where we found at first a completely different um, condition. I will not now explain how the city fabric of Hong Kong really operates or works, but um, of course uh, it, is, it, it was for us a shock and, and, uh, and, and an enchanting moment at the same time when we, we discovered for the first time an Asian city. And some of it we then started to describe, to, to draw the buildings and started a collection of these um, high performing buildings in Hong Kong, but we also went uh, actually back to New York as many architects did and do. And, and uh, in order to understand that there, again, it's the mass, the mass of the city from, from a distance, everything looks the same when you go close, every block is an individual project. There is some rules, but there is also quite a, a bit of freedom. So we start to understand that there is a constant negotiation between the collective rules of buildings that are relating to each other and the individual freedom to maximize the profit or to find the most beautiful expression in architecture. So is there still space for densification is a, is a question. I'm not showing a project in New York, neither in Buenos Aires, uh, but I'm trying to show you that what I introduced with the reading of the European city in a very general manner is something that also then applies to these um, um, metropolises, not, uh, also because they are strongly, not always, and not always to the same extent, but they are strongly influenced by the thinking and actually the, the software and sometimes also the toolbox of the European city, but exported to a new condition uh, uh, 100, 150 years ago. Uh, but even within Europe then, in order to come back, uh, uh, Rome, for instance, was a very interesting case for our findings of new types of interesting buildings that, of course, are rooted literally in the history of that context. We could also maybe find it a heavy context, but it's also a very inspiring context. And then you could see to what extent within that framework of the historic Rome, inventions happened during the 20th century. Rome, for instance, doubled twice its size during the 20th century. So, but this is not a lecture about urbanism, really. It is more uh, sharing with you one important and more and more systematic source of inspiration so that the buildings, we called it types or typology then, we actually collected these, these um, surveys in, in, in the book or actually two books and we're still in a loose series continuing this, this work. So we call the book typology and uh, it is a, it's a collection of these, of these buildings that we found. And beyond the sheer collection, we then even had, let's say, the rather unmodest um, uh, unmodest understanding of uh, design theory that we, for us at least, was a very uh, important important step when we described, I think this was maybe now, I don't know, maybe eight years ago or something, uh, typology transfer towards an urban architecture. Uh, urban architecture, as we just learned, has always been there, but it was our take on understanding how we could imagine, specifically for the Swiss context, actually, uh, that densification and transformation, typological inventions could happen also within the framework of an inherited um, um, territory like Switzerland. So the transfer, very literally understood, could be a very productive way of reimagining the existing city. And so it's a bit paradoxical. The city and its buildings are there, and still we believe we can add. And the collage is, in a way, a very simple uh, uh, and, and beautiful means, a tool to do that. And um, so I show you just a few slides of a typical street in Zurich. It's, I believe, the um, Birmansdorfer Straße with the blue tramway of 
Zurich, and there is typical grey beige Zurich houses. And then I have to admit it's a bit simplistic, but a nice panoramic view along that um, street. And sometimes in the foreground, sometimes in the background, we would have urban buildings that we loved so much and that we admired so much. We found them in New York and in Hong Kong. And for example, on the right hand side in Buenos Aires, the intermedianeras between the two party walls and so on. And it was a provocation, of course, and and some found it very beautiful. Others thought it was a bit of childish exercise. We liked the idea that we could test the presence, not only of a type actually, but of the of the real architecture in a completely new context and see what happens. So it was also a project about measuring the nature of context, how much can it take, so to say. You got the system and then actually we made like a moving a motion picture. It was then actually an eight meter screen, I think in a Rotterdam Biennale or something where we then showed that and claimed to rethink uh, Zurich. Uh, uh, but perhaps that was more uh, a graphical manifesto of a way of rethinking the city. Of course, nothing is new. The collage was introduced by Rossi. And since I'm here in Berlin, I'm not at the TU, but still, I mean, Ungers, for instance. Huh? I mean, it was all about that, right? That that Ungers, and I was speaking about grandfathers and mothers. It was more fathers than mothers at the time. But um, but Ungers also being a, a teacher or a co-teaching with Hans Kolhoff, who then actually was a teacher in order to declare myself here fully. So there is a strong, there is a strong uh, influence of also the German school, I think, in Switzerland when I was a student. And Ungers uh, was very, was uh, one of the, of I, I think, of the great architects to really, now north of the Alps, to rediscover the city. And what I introduced and I said to Rossi it applies also to Ungers in a slightly different way. He was describing, identifying patterns, as you know, morphology, and introduced or invited his students to play around with it, literally playing around, transferring a pattern found in Karlsruhe to Berlin or the other way around. So the transfer and the collage is, is actually, I think, an interesting intellectual, but also very artistic and physical practice almost for, for us uh, architects. And then the components, as you already understood, they are in the book, still the introduction. It's in the book. And uh, in the book that's now, uh, I think, is spread from New York. So we described them accurately. And then there is a whole typology. Then came more cities, Paris and Delhi in India and Sao Paulo and Athens. And, um, and you see, for example, in Athens, there's actually only one type. It's one family. It's the Polykatikia, and it applies for a garage, for an office and for housing. And this is fantastic. And it's a lesson. It's the most beautiful buildings I saw. You know, and my colleagues, my admired Valerio Oljatis and others, cool guys. But when you look at this one building, I don't know now which one it is in Athens. It's a strange plot, one column in the middle, a small ramp in the back. It's so beautiful. So bottom line, we can be inspired people, but the condition of the city is ultimately producing the better buildings than we do. That's maybe a bit a, a slightly frustrating outcome of my lecture, uh, but uh, uh, we try to somehow operate within that field. And this is the, that's the topic of my lecture. In Paris, we have the dense um, ILO, the, 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 the urban blocks that then start through the course of the 20th century to open up hygiene, light and air is introduced. The block is being cut and and uh, and uh, ensembles of, of many fragments um, start to exist um, to, to come into play where the urban figure still belongs to that tradition of the context of Paris. Yeah? But but there is a there is a certain level of individualization or emancipation that happens yeah? with these with these uh, um, ambiguous figures between figure and ground is it an independent object or does it still belong to the urban to the urban plan it's a bit hard for you now to follow in detail because it's very small the the urban context i i shouldn't be too long in that uh, however you see the redon the 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 line to the street and then it goes back and forth in order to 
increase the surface of the building. So it's, everything is in the end super rational. We had uh, interesting and very nice um, crits this afternoon. I was invited to the studio of Enrique and um, we spoke about economy of means and that uh, uh, in the end architecture is always about economy too. Not in terms of saving money or making money for the architects, but we have the responsibility to deal in an economical way with our resources, maybe more than ever. And this is exactly the mindset for so many Baumeister and developers uh, throughout the centuries. And therefore, once in a while to look back at that is actually quite interesting. However, this is then, you see the, you see the axon on the right, perhaps, but then also the stepping back of the volume. So in order to, op a bit similar to New York, I could go endless and uh, speak about these rules and the interdependence of the urban figure and the plan. Now, that's the first plan that we produced. So. I hope um, uh, you you see uh, the light at the end of the tunnel. It is still Paris, actually. So the research here in that particular case is very directly related to the practical um, um, operation of a project, a, so a social housing project in in Paris. It's uh, a, a very recent project. It's um, still sort of about to be finished. This is a model. We are celebrating the physical models. Sometimes they are nice, sometimes they are less nice. We, we, we love them, so we do have computers too, but uh, we still think it's important that we understand uh, our artifacts, the urban artifacts that we are producing. And this is a, is a, a, a linear building, basically, sitting on a plinth, the sockle. Uh, that's quite specific. Uh, you see, the building starts in the first floor. We are not building the circle, quite interesting. Uh, to the right, you can see there is an existing house. That's how it looked before we start the construction. So a typical corner of the Haussmannian uh, ILO in Paris. So speaking context, very clear set of rules, but with a big exception in the middle, I don't know whether the arrow is visible or maybe not on the, on the stream, but is it here? Yes, oh, even super visible. Uh, uh. Okay, so sorry, I didn't wasn't aware of that, but um, because on my screen it's just a very modest arrow, and there is this this light brown fieldish territory. This is related to this structure down here. It's where the subway cars emerge from the underground, and there is a maintenance site and and workshops. So it's actually building on top of urban infrastructure. Very contemporary um, uh, issue, densification, building on top of a pre-existing structure, combining different programs, and the project now is here. And the, the specificity is that it is creating. An alleyway, or I would rather say a street that is shortcutting here. The pre-existing condition is only these two buildings and the buildings there. They were they were already built in the beginning of the 20th century, and then and then somehow history changed. And we are now um, uh, sort of following an urban plan that was given. We create this linear building that follows the street and cre creates the redon and the spatial quality to which I would come in a second. Uh, that's another model, and we see the section uh, on the right is our uh, design, the workshop designed by another architect. It's a bit like the cadaver exki when you draw the belly and somebody else, the neck. It's a bit, uh, it's a French uh, surrealism in a way, but. Um, uh, and we tried to uh, to um, agree on the facade of the circle, and we managed half it's a that's us architecture too however the plan you see it now it is three cores so quite efficient it's social housing with very harsh standards which was a fantastic and important and also hard exercise for us and then that's the typical plan that you see i think in total it's more or less 110 apartments and then going up it steps back sets back so you have seen the typological examples a minute ago, and perhaps I take one half of a typical plan here. Uh, and uh, what I try to show you is small rooms, four apartments in this case, so small, small dimensions, and 
no rocket science. It's not a radical revolutionary program. It's about ma making ha um, houses for for actually partly the employees of, of the metro, but also just for low-income people. And we tried, maybe it's a typical project that only a non-Parisian or non-French architect could do. We wanted to refer back to the enfilade, to, to uh, the tradition of not creating an open plan, but rather the sequence of spaces. And you see maybe these um, annotations here. This is an arrow showing then the transversal view through a loggia, through an inner space, a, a room and another loggia, the diagonal view. So actually using a rather traditional vocabulary of forms and elements. And then, and now it's about to be finished, as I said, so that's maybe one. Oh, that's your grouse on this. Uh, I should put that uh, arrow aside. Anyway, I mean, uh, the window is the same as it is all over Paris. At least this is our idea. Here now you see. So the type is not traditional. It's a reinterpretation. The construction is actually not traditional at all. So I believe even though we are referring to, to um, elements that exist, there is always a, a, a need for or abstraction, or alienation, or somehow a crossover. In that, in that case here, it's built as a light construction actually on top of this workshop. And all the facade is in metal, a bit like a carrosserie of a car or of a metro car, right? So it is a, a, steel, a steel facade sitting on that horizontal band, which is the workshop. An architecture of which I would claim it is strongly not exclusively but strongly driven and informed by the condition of the city in order to close the first circle of argument uh, and on the other end where it's not connected to the neighbor it has a freestanding uh, um, um, gable front there is of course other types of buildings there is a that's a less recent so it's maybe uh, for those who know it it's uh, been a while that we completed the building on the railway uh, on a, in a local center outside of Basel where I live and where we work and um, it's actually a, a, a quite um, simple figure it has a socle with uh, three floors of office and then uh, I believe 16 floors of, of apartments what is quite specific though is the plan and again, I would like to refer to this indication of a typological understanding of architecture. Uh, Enrique was referring to the idea and to, let's say, a personal take on that, uh, how we imagine a building. At the same time, I would claim at least this is an aspiration or an ambition that we have, is that I think ideally uh, every project has a very specific scenario. It belongs to the place and to the program to which we are referring or which we have to deliver in the end. But ideally, we manage to achieve a certain level of generality or of, of um, yes. So a type or a principle is something that I believe we should try to achieve. At least that's what we try to do. And here, the problem was it's a freestanding tower, but one side was impossible to live because of the noise of the train. So the core is eccentric, is shifted to the top, as you can see, and then like in a fan, um, or in a fan, I mean, it opens, it 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 opens the 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 apartments, and you see, I think this is now a floor plan. Unfortunately, with three apartments only, there is a more typical one with five. However, they are more or less mono oriented which is an interesting um, uh, problem for organizing an apartment. And uh, they are very deep and they're opening up to the light. And on the side, we have a slit here, so a Schlitzfenster that is almost like closing the eyes, protected against the noise. You cannot open the window, but you can have the view. That was the idea. And then, and then in the lower part, it's very geometrical in this case. We have then a, a typical plan for the office where we doubled the size of the surface because um, we'd have a second a fire stair, uh, but metal again. So it's a galvanized steel facade. The built up of the facade is, I think it's the first timber, timber um, built up uh, in Switzerland for a high rise building. So I'm speaking fire, you know, these things which I'm not, I shouldn't be too long on them, but uh, 
they are important. They are they are what in the end makes architecture so great because it's all thought after these things. No, we think about these things. However, it's this metallic, metallic, and slightly, maybe aggressive. No, I don't know. Or slightly baddy. No, but because it's close, it's like a protect. But it's it's a very harsh place. The opposite side of the of the of the rails is all industry still. Huh? So metal industry actually. So context even then comes back into the narrative. When we approach the building, then it sort of um, embraces the the visitor. It's right at the station of that of that place, and it goes down to the detail how to bend and curve the metal. That is making the envelope of of this of this um, uh, somehow monumental, but also but also quite harsh and simple building uh, of which we like so much to think that it belongs to the feel of the urban, but also but also to the to the um, almost industrial industrial um, uh, environment. Is it a monument or does it belong to the other family of the normal case? to be debated. Uh, that's the question with the high rise. If there are many of those, if the answer is clear, actually in the meantime, there are many. So it's just a normal building. In the interior, I was referring to that idea to use a language and vocabulary that we know, but ideally we manage at least to break that. So we have an individual speak, but the words we're using, they are obviously um, well known and Translating this slightly pedagogical metaphor into materials, galvanized steel to the left, marble to the right, a simple tiles on the floor. This is then the attempt of finding a language for every building, but to a certain extent also for us as a collective of architects that we like this um, substantial, substantial presence of architecture. So if I tell you it is not about abstraction, it's about concretion. I don't know whether you can follow with that in the images, but that's at least our our intention. When it comes to the apartments, the materiality is a bit more general. Then it's about the space. This is one of the uh, specific moments when the plan turns the corner. And here, this is that one linear, the window that is, that is actually um, decreasing in height towards the entrance of the apartment at the end of the plan and here we see it from from afar not necessarily blending in but somehow belonging to that um, landscape of infrastructure another very early project let's see there's also new projects and unbuilt projects there's a little bit of everything so um but this for the argument i thought it was important uh, because We've seen now two housing projects. We see a third housing project, which is uh, on that triangular block hmm, here. Again, I would claim it is the urban condition in the first place that is defining the starting point to the project. And, um, and you see here, this is more or less, I, th I think 180 meters or so. It's one side of a, of a even, uh, of a of a triangle triangular block uh, with with uh, three identical sides here. And when we see it in the model, we understand that the 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 urban condition of a, a boulevard that is making the street. And the courtyard is actually making the project. The idea was very simple and it, in, in, in a way quite not artistic, but it was a free gesture of, of a moving line to the courtyard. It was not just the pleasure of celebrating form. It was related to, to um, a very rational idea of, of introducing additional view and orientation to the back because it's a clear north it's totally north oriented so by inclin by introducing an inclination in the plan we would we would allow for west or east orientation and then it's uh, very rational the irregularity of the of this line 
produces a great problem. We were speaking about creating our own problems as architects. It's a fantastic problem because there is not a single constant moment where the depth of the building of the plan is the same. So it varies, I think, in total between six and 18 meters or something. The type actually is always the same. It's a transversal space and then the rooms, uh, I, I shouldn't be, maybe be too long about it, but so I, I, if I remember well, it's something like, um, 45 different types that are created, including the setback on the top, um, uh, along that one, um, uh, along that one um, a line that we were introducing. So I, I was calling it testing the limits of a type. Is it still the same type? Maybe it's an academic conversation, but at least it's a, a, a great variety of different spaces, and that's, it's quite a and still is quite a beautiful um, um, and I think a, a much liked. Um, um, housing building where we try to also, that's a corner type, which is pretty specific, but still where we tried to um, achieve a certain level of generosity and maybe we would relate it also to rather that was at the time very important for us. There is always precedence. It was uh, maybe the post-war Italian architecture that was very, that was, we were very much looking at at the time. There is also others maybe, but the Latin Mediterranean, Spanish, um, uh, uh, Italian influence. Uh, and uh, one or two other moments in that extremely rich and very varied, um, um, but still very rational uh, development of, of these uh, apartment buildings. I mean, it's always nice, huh, but that's a... Uh, uh, the urban condition at the time was rather harsh. It's a developing neighborhood in the north of Basel, so it's in our in our town. And you see the different faces of, of um, that's to the outside on the corner, that's the inside where we see the, the, the varied plants and balconies, and that's the front uh, to, the, to the street. Okay, this uh, leads me then to another project in Basel. It's a bit more recent. I think on the day we opened the, the, this, or we could inaugurate and show to our friends and colleagues this housing block was the last jury day of the Kunstmuseum competition, which was a big thing for us. And then we had to show, celebrate this building. No? For us, it was a very big building. It's a bit anecdotic, forgive me, but still imagine as a group of architects, we did this. We did this building, and we invited friends. And only thing we had in our minds is: did we win the competition or not? You know. And I mean, I, 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 I don't remember who was only the city architect and one other guy of the jury. In retrospect, it was clear that I think they decided that we would win, but it was a horrible moment for us. That's why, um, um, emotionally speaking, this project and the Kunstmuseum uh, is related. But that's. We can maybe cut it out from the stream. It's not important. But uh, but uh, uh, what is what is more what is more important is that I believe there is also a connection and a relation when it comes to the project itself. And I think this is more interesting that whether it's a housing block or a museum, the way we try to position ourselves as authors and as architects, it is always somehow thought or perceived or imagined from the city, von der Stadt her gedacht, in a way. So, of course, a museum is a public building. So, according to Rossi, uh, it is a monument. It is uh, belonging to that outstanding um, um, family. At the same time, uh, uh, I still believe um, a museum, whatever museum it is, is also part of, let's say, the urban community. This is to be understood as a statement perhaps against the now not so much in fashion anymore star architecture of spectacular objects that are uh, trying to um, acquire a high degree of autonomy and uh, and sort of a recognizable uh, instagrammable um, figure so then um, basel is different huh? so you see this is actually the authentic model that we built from the start here gedacht in the competition in a scale one to 100 in Carport, and we uh, used it in, um, to in, to actually find the right form for the building. And the building is here in the center. Uh, to the right, there is the existing museum. So it is an extension. It is this dialogue of which you spoke, Enrique, but it's still a 
independent building across the street. Quite a weird condition, adding something to an existing building, but keeping it at a distance. There is a, um, a underpass connecting the two. Looking from uh, an aerial view, we recognize the situation here. This rectangular um, plan is the existing museum from the 1930s. And here, this slightly more complicated filled in figure is the extension building, as, as you can see. And if you go closer to the model, we understand a bit more precisely. It is a perfectly a perfect fit to that random parcel almost eh? it's it's a it's a cornerstone in the city fabric it's in a very interesting moment where where the medieval city got expanded in the 14th century etc and then came the 19th century up to the 20s so it's a very very complex uh, moment in the in the urban fabric where different systems overlap uh, uh, Actually, in the model, probably you saw it, here is a bridge. So it's also a very exposed, beautiful moment at the end of that bridge. That's one, one um, system or one spatial um, um, orientation that was important to, to define the, the, the plan here. The other one is, of course, the existing building. So you see the new building is addressing these different geometries the different systems of reference, if you will, and it is also trying to explicitly speak to that old building. One can debate whether one should be, speak to a building like that. I mean, we took the position, yes, we should. Also having understood that Kunstmuseum Basel, uh, owning or sheltering one of the most important painting collections in the world, strongly related to the history of the place and the citizenship and the community of, of, of the first public art collection, I believe, in, in, in Europe. Uh, so it, it's a heavy history. And in the 1930s, they took it seriously with the heaviness of that history. And they went to Italy and looked into Italian types. So it's the same thing. Eh? Uh, and it was not Ungers at the time. It was Bonatz. And Bonatz was actually a very influential teacher and, and architect who, who um, uh, was in the jury there and, uh, and the local architect called Christ actually uh, by coincidence as, as, as I do, was a young architect who entered his competition project in the 1930s and it was okay, but not good enough. So Bonatz being the member in the jury, he said, come on, I, I look after this guy. And so Bonatz, professor from Stuttgart, he did actually, but I think for, the, for, for, for a very good um, outcome, he then um, um, imposed his ideas on this very classical plan. So it's a collaboration, the project. It's a very interesting um, museum, and I think it is highly acclaimed in the meantime. Of course, it is strongly uh, influenced by the, it, by the interest of a, of a rather conservative modern movement in the 1930s. I mean, it was conceived in the late 20s. Um, and um, and Ungers actually is using then this plan in his famous Berlin lectures where he speaks about the type of museum. So it's a, it's a, it's a, a sequence of spaces and courtyards. We made a very early collage. This is more or less authentic. The message is clear. The new building is a freestanding, autonomous, I guess self-confident contribution to that city. At the same time, it belongs clearly to what's already there, say at eye level, so to say. And so it's about that dialogue. Uh, if we want to use the metaphor, uh, uh, there is difference and there is analogy. And this is the conceptual framework in, in simple words that leads us to the whole project. When it was built, it looked like that. It's, it's still more or less like this. It's gray brick in different tones or graduations. So when I was so, um, so amazed or so pleased to see that there is a theory about time in architecture, it was maybe then also, uh, uh, that's also architects. They read books and then they make bricks out of it. So um, time and then the layers of the sedimentation of time, you know, the traces of time, the patina of a building, why not artificially trying to 
enhance this perception by having this gray bit sort of already a bit dirt and dust on the bricks and it's maybe also like growing from the grounds which it actually is because the museum is a substantial part is underground i mean some of you i think visited it not so long ago uh, however it's the gray brick and then there is and i think it's important so it's not about the, the Roman ruins and all the history of Italy, uh, it's, uh, it's, also, it's also about, of course, finding a contemporary expression. I'm not saying that putting letters on the building is necessarily very contemporary. On the Pantheon, I believe there is also big letters. But what is a bit more tricky here, what we're looking at is static in the picture. Also, when it was taken, it was static, it was not moving. The dark is not brick, but it's, sh it's actually shadow. So. And I have to explain it because nowadays it's unfortunately not very often used like that. Do you see the light part between the letters? They are actually lit with a with a LED light source. So the the shadow in a in a in a in a relief of the of the brick is compensated by a computer supported system of of creating that visual effect that it flattens maybe you understood what i wanted to say maybe not but I, i'm still very amazed and then of course it can also look like that it was even the case that jenny holzer used it for display but also other artists did um, so the idea is yes it can communicate yes it can maybe create a relationship between a rather close and hermetic presence of a brick wall monolithic brick wall and its content which I believe is important, and um, and it also speaks about let's say the contemporaneity of of uh, what we're doing. And I show you some more images turning somehow around this strange object, which believe belongs very strongly to that specific place, and at the same time it has, I believe, still um, a, a high degree of autonomy uh, since it is detached actually from all the sites. Here we go closer. You see the bricks. You see the collision with scale and materials of the neighborhood. It's actually not, uh, it's not a very public um, 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 plot. Uh, the back is a, is a casual backyard where maybe the building is even more beautiful. And here we're looking back and you see in the background uh, the old building of the museum. If we look at, at it from a distance, then we also understand that the notion of context and the types of buildings is continued in that, in that view here. So the Kunstmuseum, from the 1930s was again referring to other and um, previously existing buildings opposite and in the same row. And what you also can see there is of course the Roche Tower by Herzog de Meuron. So we are building up our practice in the shadow of this tower in a way, so it appeared there, but it's also where the money um, for the museum was partly produced, so I think it's Fair enough that the tower, uh, when I saw it first, I thought, fuck, now is this tower there, but it's okay. It's, now it's two towers, actually. It's even more beautiful, I must say. And then here is, is this, the, the opposite view where, where, where it relates to the street from the 1910s. And this is now the plan. And I think you could follow, hopefully, more or less. We were turning more or less around the corner here. There is the bridge. This line is the projection then into that kinked corner here and the bridge the approach from that side from the other side of the river is somehow defining that that um, um angle here so this was the only thing we invented was that kink and this creates somehow a vertical proportion in the facade and makes an entrance and then just Tell you the recipe how we design a building so it's the urban condition we try to we work it in the model typically first plastic and then the carport that you saw and then we try to find the spatial and typological principle inside and here it is very didactic almost it's like two boxes or two buildings within the building one is parallel to the one main street to the left huh, where we have the old museum and the other one the squarish sorry the squarish one is then parallel to the other medieval street that we that we saw on the top left uh, top right and then what remains and and the galleries are rectangular and the stairs space for circulation also for whole for the whole technical and systems pipes and ducts they then they are then in the poche or in the remaining polygonal rather odd geometries of what's left uh, in the plan and here we are now in the center 
I'm sometimes losing. Ah, that is Komisch. Yeah. Okay, I wanted to. Ah, maybe this is after 48 minutes, it starts to take the arrow out of my toolbox here. That's the central stairs. So that's what I want to show you. A very dynamic, very sculptural space. Again, at gray is the color we love most still. I mean, there are different shades of gray, but uh, still, I, I, um, I, I think it's a very, very architectonic, uh, architectonical um, color. Some people find it very gray. We like it. It's concrete, partly. Uh, it's marble and stucco that is combined here in this entrance hall and, 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 and stairs that lead then to the top or to the underground. So there's also in some parts of this gray system of generous spaces, which are sort of foyers, there is also art exhibition in, in changing formats. Like I think that's the underpath actually under the two museums with a beautiful moment when, when a Jeff Wall was um, presented at a few, I think, um, beautiful works. And then if we go now into the boxes, the materiality and the atmosphere is totally different. So it's almost an urbanistic decision. The street is public and is gray and the interior is then different. It belongs to the art, even though, I mean, this is, was a, a specific um, um, show when then there, the walls are painted. That's how changing exhibitions are, are often, often presented, as you know. And we can debate on another occasion whether then the colors is always the right thing. The typological structure of the museum is, is much is more simple. This is... Uh, you remember the cross from the plan. So these are the four galleries that then form one entity. That's on the top level where we have daylight from the from the roof. This is just the empty galleries before before um, art and people came in. And then the first presentation was a delicate operation with showing sculptures in galleries that were mainly designed for paintings, um, as it was asked. But it was still beautiful to see the Donald Judd here or or, or the Carl Andre that we had, or then also this. And, and fantastic work by Bruce Naumann. Uh, and there are windows, and there are windows actually of the same proportion as the old building, and we're looking out into that context of which I spoke so much. Uh, but uh, ultimately, <laughs> it's about these paintings. That's just a selection of the, of the collection that I show you here. And um, we were having the debate this afternoon, how much architecture is right for presenting arts. That's another whole loop that we could make on authority and the white cube and how much is there a need of abstraction or can it be concrete as I said a minute or a half an hour ago for some curators the floor maybe also um the 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 threshold and the reveal in in different materials is already a bit too much we found it extremely important that that load bearing wall can be intuitively perceived as such, and then the massive plaster is set in front of it. So there is a tectonic articulation, even in that very moment when you just go from one room to the other, in order to break it now down from urbanism to physical architecture, where we try to really establish a system that is coherent from the very big scale to the very small scale. And then some more beautiful <laughs> works. I like this slightly dumb photography that is ultimately saying it's about the artwork. We can also debate this, whether this is the museum of our times. And I would say here, and I say it proudly, but also understanding that we have to debate that. It is an attempt of creating a classic museum uh, in the 21st century. And is that still possible, question mark? Uh, I learned also that many people think it was been a sort of a, a, a continuous development to the Centre Pompidou maybe yeah, 50 years ago. And from then on, that's my question, is it Centre Pompidou only that can exist or is it still possible to think of a museum? And you understand it's a rhetorical question from my side. I believe, yes, it's possible to still think of a museum or an art space that is oriented versus focus to a certain extent, introspection and contemplation, which doesn't necessarily mean that there is no social interaction, which actually happens a lot in this museum, but it is ultimately about this, right? And um, uh, so, and it's honest modesty when I'm saying this, we were 
taking the position that in ultimately architecture should create a framework or yeah the container for art that's the kunstmuseum uh, project on the start here gedacht but ultimately it is dedicated of course to the artwork in the first place and the people um, enjoying negotiating sort of uh, the art uh, again and again there is a second kunstmuseum project of which i will not explain otherwise we will run um, completely out of time but uh, uh, we are we won another competition which i'm very glad uh, for uh, this is now the transformation and renovation of the old building yeah. where there is a, a a big part is denkmalpflegerische renovation so it's heritage and it's it's preservation but it is also about uh, a series of subtle small interventions in the ground floor mainly and uh, in the surroundings of that old museum in order to activate it as a place and to relate it in a new manner to the city and to to its activities and um it's small subtle interventions maybe it's just a display of art or temporary gastronomy it's maybe a few a few um, small openings that would uh, increase the porosity of such a place uh, in order to here, um, nobody would understand what's different from the museum today, but uh, if we had time, I would tell you it's the, it's the ground floor is, new, is, is now open, it's not open. The terrace are, uh, above is not accessible, it will be accessible. And uh, by doing these small things, or here, you see the perspective into a garden that is behind the building that is inaccessible today, there is the potential for a fantastic sculpture garden, for instance. So small things not necessarily big inventions but using the potential that lies in what's already there and that's maybe one part of the lesson that i try to 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 share with you and then there's a third or, or another another same style same type of problem and in a way i i'm even tempted to say same type of answer to the problem that i'm presenting here in a project i also like these photographs by stefano graziani it takes a bit of courage for an architect to show such a working model but i think maybe it looks okay and it's a it's a gray um, working model on a on a gray table uh, walraf richards museum in cologne again a quite um, important and beautiful paint small museum painting collection and there is a um there is a extension project to that museum we are looking at the city center of cologne to the right you see the river the rhine and then here more or less a almost square roof plan which is the museum that uh, oswald matthias ungers built or designed in 1996 and then i i guess it was even completed um uh, in the beginning of the new millennium so one of his last projects uh it is a built I think very interesting, very typological, very Ungers. So it's a lesson on urbanism and type. So uh, uh, it, it's beautiful to relate it back to what I tried to to share with you at the beginning. Um, however, to the left of that of that um, Ungers building uh, is then the new the new exhibition, small exhibition building. You see it in a in a sketchy model. Here you see it on a in a rendering, one of the few renderings. Again, it's the brick. Again, we could maybe call it an artistic strategy. Maybe it's mannerism. The layers of the brick, it's literally almost in this case with the open socle. So lift from the ground, maybe hovering above the ground, but the sedimentation of the Roman, of the Roman <laughs> uh, ruins that we might find that we actually did find in, in Cologne. But it's a symbolic metaphorical gesture that in the end is architecture so it's not about about the intellectual pleasure of of introducing images that nobody sees i believe in the end the fact that this is a heavy wall in brick varying the different bricks and and the way you are the masonry is 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 laid out it has an impact on how the body this building is appearing and is it now belonging to to the milieu is it a, is it just the urban block or is it a monument again it's not so clear 
by the materiality, the degree of not abstraction, but presence of materiality, the absence of windows, we believe it acquires the presence of a non-conventional building and the circle opening an additional space as an additional entrance is of course maybe giving emphasis to that claim yes i'm belonging to the block i'm belonging to the urban to the urban system but at the same time i'm a public building even using again letters names which actually is already yeah the arrow is in the right place on the ungus building you have a uh, ian richards and finley works with with um with um, names, so we somehow also refer to that. Connected underground, as I said, three levels of, of exhibition floors um, in the new building. Similar, similar system, but it's a big hall. So it's a different in terms of the use. It's a more flexible hall, but it's a, and a very linear space. That's a cross section, so not very wide. I think it's like 11 meters, and then it's maybe 30 meters long. So quite an interesting, but also not so easy space for exhibition. But so there is a system of flexible walls that then would um, would then subdivide the spaces. And you also understand that there is then back of house, courtyard, storage. So it's not just the exhibition. It's also another house that is being used for office and housing. Uh, that's the not, it's not the completely last version anymore. It's a bit older already. I do apologize for the drawings, but it is, you see, so it's the exhibition, but then also another office building and a, and a small um, um, residential building. So actually the project is an art space, but it's an urban repair work as well. So in that case, we were very happy that we could combine the two. And there you see, again, oops, something up. Here, this is the Ungos. This is uh, uh, the, the ruin of, of the, the church with the Kete Kolwitz, and this is the Gürzenich. So this is a very, very significant um, uh, block in, in Cologne, and this is our rather modest um, um, echoing of, of this configuration. This is actually the project, and these are the models as we are testing different versions of it. It was a competition we won 10 years ago, uh, and we know the administration of Cologne very well in the meantime. And... Um, yeah, but that's also the context. I don't want to make stupid jokes, but that's also the context of the European city. And it's Germany, but Switzerland is not much better. But that's another, that's an, again, a whole other discourse. Uh, okay, now from the another project in Germany, it's the headquarters of Roche Pharmaceuticals. It's outside Basel. So it's actually, again, almost in my hometown, but uh, and it's on a campus. Again, an urban condition, but a completely different urban condition. It's not the historic pre 19th century um, um, fabric. It's a campus and a, and a production site that grew over the 20th century. And that site got developed in the spirit of the 1950s uh, with a beautiful mensa, as you can see here. And you see a model uh, of the of um, uh, um, Roland Rohn, who was a, 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 a a disciple or student of, of a collaborator of Salvisberg. So it's this tradition. And that's another model that then we did. And uh, 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 yeah. And actually, it's only a part of that campus. We made a master plan that's very simple it's box, boxes, rectangular buildings, and the spaces in between. So it's, of course, not about the figure, it's also about the ground. And uh, uh, especially, I think, if we speak about a modern plan, we have to be very careful. This is the first building, do you see here, that we built 10 years or more uh, ago. And this is a more recent completion that we just finished actually last year. And I want to show it to you very briefly, the two boxes, if I may call them like that. It's about working environment, office in, in, in the first place. Uh, we started with this building. Again, not very recent. I do apologize for those who are already very familiar with it. Actually, everybody is familiar with it because it's uh, the modern building par excellence. I mean, it's <laughs> it's columns and slabs. I mean, more boring is almost not possible. We still then having having our our slightly classicist trigger uh, that we cannot completely um, 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 omit. We we then tried to not just repeat the slab but to increase its 
its um, dimension. So it's getting somehow paradoxically heavier to the top. And by doing that, uh, the intention was to create an integrity of a body and not just a section or a part, a portion of a system, if you understand what I'm trying to say. So that's a related to a problem of composition, if you will. Uh, the spatial idea was clear. It's a free plan. It's a linear building. It has one specificity. The model doesn't show it. In reality, you can see it 20% more or less of the floor plan. It's not much, but we convinced the clients that towards the center of that new campus that we are trying to create, that there is an extra space that is not programmed, that people can just use. And it actually happens in the meantime. And it is also nice because it reduces the building to that principle we were so interested in. And the plan is um, displayed here. To the right, you would have that loggia. The loggia relates to the grid and the urban plan of, of, that, of that small site. It then relates, of course, to these neighboring buildings uh, in terms of size and proportion. And that's a view from the inside onto that loggia. The inside has then an inlay in order to make a clear differentiation between the, the main structure of the building and sort of its um, inhabitation. You see the carpet, of course. It's not done, it's not, it's not a collaboration with an artist. Uh, we just did it ourselves, which is a bit strange for an architect. I'm, I'm not necessarily ironic about that. It's really interesting how to make decisions. If you always relate so to clear principles, we see glass walls. There is also, nowadays, everything is filled in with furniture and curtains and all the transparency is gone, but that's a different story. What I think is interesting, it is really the project that, and to the left, you can see it, it metaphorically speaking, as Visually here, it is mirroring the language of modern architecture. And in that sense, again, it is related to the specific context of that urban condition of these buildings uh, that were already there uh, when we arrived. And then there is a second um, step. We're looking back at this building with its strange loggia. And I'm standing here, or the picture is taken from the construction site of that building that we now add it to the campus. It's still somehow a variation on the classical modern, if you will, if we speak about the formal aspect, but I think it's less about the language, but more about the proportion, the space, and actually the functional type that we are proposing here. But this is the building. It has four stories on the ground floor, so five stories in total. They are all of the same um, height. That's the short facade, I think it's 35 by 55 meters. So it's not very big, but it's clearly deeper than a typical plan of an office building. And I think that's interesting. And that's what we were interested in, at least. And uh, you see the crosses, they are giving the horizontal stability. That's a very um, a basic. We liked it as a not pragmatic, but practical choice. There's one exception. There's a double height space in the center. That's a big auditorium. And what you can already see from the section, there is no, um, there is, um, since there is that free space, there is um, a change in the structural system in the center. Mm -hmm. And this is important because this leads to this plan, which I still like very much. And we were obsessed in creating that plan. And uh, so it's a box, huh? but sometimes I say it's maybe not a magical box, but at least it's stressed to the edge in the sense that the corner, the core, what typically is in the center of an office building is pushed to the four corners, the four stairs, and then also the elevators and the infrastructure shafts is all on the on the on the corner. And you see the load bearing system here. Actually, the the the, the walls in the corner they are not even part of the of that system. They are only separating the stairs from the rest. And then we're looking at a free plan and a beautiful exercise in organizing that territory of the working environment. We just defined it sh very um, shortly before the COVID uh, hit then um, the working uh, environment of this company as of all of us. Still, I think in these type of companies, they have a minority of people is back to the office. Uh, but that's another story again. It was interesting to see, but that is so flexible. It's radically flexible that actually we did the right thing and we only maybe knew it by intuition. And then you see this free plan is made possible by 
like a corporate ceiling system, a sort of a grid that is above above that plan spanning over this sensor. And we built the models and we tested, of course, that all this working environment. That's actually in Westke in Basel, where the Sobecha, the Sobechano studio was making projects. And there, that's where our archives is and where our, um, a part of our models were built. And uh, and then this is the big models. Yeah? So, uh, uh, and actually the way the models were built, that's the way the building is built in a way. No? And then that's pre-fabricated pre, um, 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 corporate structures, so cassetten, right? like Right. And, and then they are brought to site and then and then connected. It's quite a, a interesting um, if I could also go into detail here, which I don't, but I think it is then again, the urban figure informs the type, the type informs the construction. Sorry for being so didactic. And then a few shots from the interior. That's a ground floor uh, moments in the upper floors where again, there is layers of transparency and translucent um, screens that are somehow creating the zoning of that big one plateau and and then and then the center where we have the double height space within that same structure and perhaps the most interesting is then when the geometry is broken and we're looking into the corner where it opens up in a quite generous um, staircase that is then reaching sort of out into into the into the surrounding uh, campus it's not very original, but it's quite effective as a space. And then that box is broken on the corner, which I think is important. So the figure is simple. Is it hermetic or is it open? I think ideally a building is not just hermetic. It always gives a clue or a hint towards something that is questioning its own form. Uh, I just go on. Uh, is it okay still? Are we, are we okay? Uh, so I... Can I? I can stop at any moment uh, because uh, I think the theory is the theory is clear, and now I can give endless examples. I, I speed up. It's an industrial site again. That's why it relates maybe nicely to the previous uh, Roche one that's on the Lake of Zurich. It's the chocolate factory of Lind and Sprüngli, still producing chocolate since more than 100 years. So there is an authentic truth to that. At the same time, the urban environment completely changed. It's a it's a, it, it transformed into, a, a, let's say, rather attractive um, residential neighborhood, but still there is, there is this factory. And we had to add a big building, which is a sort of a museum or museum or, a, but not only a museum, it's also a research center, a commercial venue um, in order to, to promote actually, uh, or, or ultimately the chocolate. And we built a big, again, a, <laughs> it's not brown, it's reddish, it's brick. And uh, and it relates to some of the buildings on that side. So if the notion of dialogue is, is, is still valid or valuable, I think it is also here that we tried to enter into that dialogue uh, while at the same time making a very bold statement for a building that is not a fancy chocolate museum so you will be disappointed in a minute it is a, rather an industrial building uh, but but it tries to create almost or to achieve almost a public a public dimension in its interior so the type is not so easy to describe i would say it's a box yes and then you see to the like <laughs> block of chocolate <laughs> sorry but uh, and i don't remember with, whether we were that's trivial when we try to find the form, but somehow we cut out the corner in order to create an entrance. So maybe the Kunstmuseum in Basel experience, even though it had a different level of precision maybe here, it is then the attempt to create that moment of entering a building that basically has an atrium. And so it's, the, it's a mall or a lobby that is surrounded by different by different um, activities. There is production, kind of testing new chocolate um, tastes and, and uh, whatever, I mean, new chocolate, but also a shop. And then on the upper floor, there is a big exhibition um, on the history of chocolate. And you see, you see um, uh, uh, a so-called pilot plan for research and development. But you also see that then, and then on the upper floor, there is uh, offices and some other some other um, facilities. So, but what the essential part of the project is 14 columns that are 
defining this atrium in the center. This is this elongated rectangular space in the center. I'm a bit timid in using the arrow because then it, but here. So this, I'm speaking about that. And actually the system, the structural typological system is these columns, but the columns are not just columns. They are also half, half circular um, um, shafts to incorporate uh, the ventilation ducts. They, they are combined with the spiral stairs or with lifts. So it is uh, exercise in trying to test the principles that people like uh, Louis Kahn or others were pu putting forward maybe in a more radical and a bit a more cleaned up way. But um, so this is the plan uh, uh, that is the actual only loads bearing system where together with the outer wall. So it is a the perimeter wall is is load bearing and then these these columns, which then if we would go closer, were quite a tricky thing to engineer. It's actually big mushroom columns that the capitals are carrying the load or shortening the span of the of the of the of the slab. So there is uh, I sometimes call it sort of the rational of the irrational or the rationality of the irrational or the other way around. So first you make a gesture and it's spatially driven. We develop this project in the model. And then we try to measure it and to rationalize it without destroying somehow maybe the intuitive move of how we tried to distribute these elements, which then created this space when it was under construction. So it's a concrete structure that is very expressive or expressionist almost. Uh, it is a concrete structure of which we also ask ourselves, is this sustainable to use this concrete, of course. Huh? So uh, also just making that remark that we developed many projects in timber construction and others uh, um, uh, as well. Here, the concrete given the industrial, industrial um, um, aspect of the program seemed to be the right. We tried to imagine it as a sustainable in terms of being flexible. So it's an open structure. The daylight comes from the, from the top. It is the stairs, the gangways that are in concrete and the slabs and all the plan is open. So the, the promise of the building would be that maybe one day it would it would adapt its program. But what stays, and I made the point earlier today, is actually the quality of that public space. So it's a public space within an industrial site. And this is actually the story of the project. Huh? And this happens in many, many industrial sites because the urban environment has changed. They become part of the city. And often these sites are trying to establish a relationship with the public. However, this is some other shots. This was actually the model. <laughs> and this is now, uh, that was before then it was invaded by chocolate and there is a fantastic chocolate fountain in the middle. And of course it has a bit something of a machinery. Uh, that was the that was the scenario that people would be moved maybe like blocks of chocolate through the production plant. This is then the offices before they got um, um, uh, yes um, in use. And uh, here we see a little bit uh, a view onto onto this um, pilot plant uh, and some more shots. Ultimately, I would I would like to to relate it again to this to this um, framing environment with this wonderful building to the left that you see in the foreground. But also, it is the view now of this screen uh, that's making the exception in the system. I think it's important that in every project we are able to establish these very clear hierarchical decisions when it comes to form. Uh, Christoph Gantenbein once, when he was speaking about it in a lecture, he, I think he spoke about Redentore by Palladio. I think it's a bit bold, but in a way maybe it's true. Eh? It's the brick box in the back and then the white screen in the front. It's not a church. Maybe there is a bit of a desire for a chocolate cathedral. I cannot completely deny that. but uh, but. Uh, it was an attempt, and there I'm less ironic, it is an attempt to, to also serve a rather commercial purpose, if you will, with the proper means of architecture. So um, it's a Venturi topic of the decorated shed or a decorated monument here. Okay, now um, we have to go fast. There's Munich. Another historic structure, you see the halls in the center, the circular one, this is the Postfuhramt in München. Actually, one of the halls, 
the one here is not really a hall, it's more a bar. This is a new structure, this is a new building, it's a residential building that uh, we built uh, uh, after a competition that we could win. So it was trying to introduce an element into a pre-existing order of a surrounding, a surrounding block uh, that had a pitched roof. Uh, it's, uh, it's a very interesting structure and then the big halls in the center. Uh, these are the plans. I'm showing the plans because the section, as you can see here to the left, and so this square has to go or maybe goes uh, um, the To the left, we see the inclination to the top. So the plans are wide in the, in the, in the lower part and then they got more um, narrow in the top. The floor plans are not so nice anymore. The developer didn't understand our intention, but still that it has the grid and, and the rhythm of, of that typologically open structure, the flexible plan that is erected on that on that um, footprint is what we wanted to achieve. And I think, and it's cladded in, in, um, in ceramics uh, uh, and that's uh, the urban figure that we could that we could build and how it is then with with the lodges in this inclinated facade. It's what is now already since a couple of years, uh, um, I think, um, appreciated in that transforming neighborhood ne near the station in Munich and the Arnoldstrasse is what you see in the foreground. There's another project on der Stadt her gedacht. It's a mixed use building in Hamburg. This is the, um, the Hopfenmarkt and the, and the, uh, and the Fleet. Uh, so it is a building that again, is a new building, but it is in dialogue with what's there a brick building that faces the river or the, the canal and the square. I was speaking about uh, about um, Kolhoff. I think it's less Kolhoff, it's maybe Pölzig, no? what, what I, and that could be a, another whole lecture. So still when, when Swiss architects go to Northern Germany, they think of bricks and uh, that's what we did out of the bricks. It's, I think, an interesting project. Uh, it consists of two parts. They are integrated into one uh, in plan. To the left, we see office, flexible office. To the right, bottom right, there is uh, the possibility for um, apartments. Maybe what's interesting is the architecture is the facade. I'm not saying it's a Coran Shell project, but almost. So how to build an urban facade in such a delicate position in the, in the, in the urban plan? Uh, and this is what we tried. It's a load-bearing facade, cladded in brick, and um, there it's a it's a bit brutal. So we like the idea that the columns are quite heavy. So a bit maybe uh, that there is plasticity. It's not just uh, glued on grid, but there is the tectonics that is still tangible from the inside. It would of course lead to that rhythm that is maybe not. Uh, 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 so unique, but I think it's quite an interesting proportion. And then uh, on the flat side, when it comes to the lower part of the building, where the um, apartments are, there then these columns uh, make the architecture, if you will, almost of the whole apartment, right? And that's then uh, a close-up. This is still, uh, I think, the, there's some demolition work that had to happen in order to make the that's now under construction, right? And I think that's a second last or so. Is it okay still? 82 minutes is a bit limit. Huh? It's quite... I'm also um, known as the Fidel Castro of our architecture. So um, uh, uh, I try to behave. And uh, Center for Laboratory Medicine, I show it because I think the principles uh, are the same. But again, it's a different program. So whether we, we got the message, whether it's a a residential building or a museum or a laboratory. It's about its relation to that um, urban environment. That's the model. It's in St. Gallen, which is a beautiful um, city in, in, in Switzerland. And the project is actually here. And I found out it's, and now it's here. In the meantime, on the, on the Schwarzplan, there is the new hospital that is not built by us. We just do this small thing here. It was an early sketch, or not the final one, but you see that there is the column again. It's a sort of a loggia, what we found in Roche, 
if you remember the white one, somehow it's a similar motif that is here addressing that important urban uh, boulevard that is actually was the main the main preoccupation of the city architects. Why there was a competition was less for the lab. It was how to occupy that specific moment in the in uh, towards that pu important public space. And we were experimenting with two parts. So a very uh, almost a bit schematic design that says there is a there is a head somehow to the building and Gesicht and Kopf and then and then the part to the back which is the actual lab. It's not necessarily a very big building, but it consists of these three parts. It's like a three a three part tight system, but somehow upside down or flipped to the side. And also structurally speaking, it's it's a uh, big big um, uh, arches. Or, or frames that are making the structure of the part in the back, which is the, the, the lab floors, and then the columns uh, in the front. Uh, in section, you would see it is five floors uh, on two on a sock floor and, and two basements. So uh, a quite small proportion, which actually leads to a very interesting plan. The entrance and the main stairs is in the front to the street, so that's very logical. The typological principle is not complicated. Um, since we are in Berlin, I would refer to the famous perspective by Schinkel. I know it's a bit unmasked, it uh, has nothing to do, but still we were thinking of it. We look out once you reach uh, your, your upper level, you would re look uh, back uh, onto this um, St. Gallen version of Lustgarten. And then in the back is the open plan. And that's, I think, also why we won the competition. It's very, it's in that sense, very practical, uh, pragmatic almost. It's a timber frame structure that is making the, the, the second part, whereas the columns in the front, they are um, rammed earth. Um, so this is uh, quite a bit of an investigation. Uh, uh, and and uh, it was an attempt to find a credible and somehow tectonic expression for renewable building materials and the components that are becoming so important, which is also photovoltaic panels, for instance, you know, that they that they are not only serving on a technical level the building, but they but that they um, become part of its language, which is of course a big topic. Again, could be a whole seminar, you know. I don't know how it is in Germany right now, but in Switzerland it's public buildings. They are to be cladded with photovoltaic, which on the one hand is fine, of course, but on the other hand, it's not fine. We have to find answers for that. And this is maybe a very modest um, uh, contribution to that conversation. This is a project that is still in planning. Uh, another project somehow related in different ways to what you just saw is uh, the new university hospital in Zurich. It's a big project. That's why I make it short. It's in the center of the city. It's the beautiful neighborhood of the university and ETH, probably you know it. So it's it's actually a, a, a very central site. We have uh, developed a master plan for development over the next 30 years. You see these bigger buildings in the middle ground of the picture. The site, the first models, they go back to the 1940s, where, where important Swiss architects, Hafele, Moser, Steiger, built then this hospital that was very new at the time. It was clearly conceived in the spirit and in the logic of modern functionalism, but it started already to somehow become organic in a way. No, It is related to topography. The landscape, the garden was very important, so it's not just a rigorous layout of a functionalist plan. It starts to interact and relate to not only the topography, but the, the urban environment again. So vital bauen in a certain sense was already there when it started. And we are now uh, have the noble, but not so easy task to continue this vital bauen on that very specific site. Partly the buildings will stay, partly they will be replaced. It's a huge clinic, so it's a big thing. We uh, almost as the Charité here, uh, uh, but not that big and complex. One building here that is important is the main building of the university, which is just opposite, where actually um, Rossi speaks about it in his autobiography, I just remember now. However, it's a sort of a two courtyards, two, building, two buildings combined into one, and they even have a tower in the center. You see it now on the bottom of the plan. This is the typological context, and you see the main elements of our design would be the four, the, the three courtyards and the one 
era. This is actually the that's the master plan to be developed. Uh, so, and that's then in the context of this whole Hochschulquartier. What is important? It is not a typical hospital. If you look into types, it's the first plan for a hospital we designed. That's maybe why we were lucky to have a slightly different take on what a hospital is. It's not necessarily just a pancake in the uh, uh, on the floor and then and then a slab on top as we did or. Uh, our cities were built or hospitals in the 70s, 60s, 70s and 80s. So it's really about that neighborhood and if possible, creating connections and a certain porosity within that big system. And I think that's what is in a very, in a very short version, the story of that hospital beside many, many other things. It is still trying to be a public place, an urban, a urban building that belongs to the neighborhood as much as it belongs to that system which is underground where then everything is connected and that's the first phase that we are now we started preparing the site so this is a bit the biggest project in our office by far it doesn't look so big but it's actually quite big this is two buildings connected into one sitting on that circle that you saw this sort of artificial topography we then at some point called it like a Doppel Palazzo, so it's a functionalist machine, but it's also a house or a building. So the dignity of an urban presence is still something that I believe is important also for a hospital, that it relates to the place where it stands. So it is about that structure. This is a structural model from the competition, I believe. So in the end, you don't have much at hand as an architect when it comes to the hospital. Huh? It's a, a few a few columns and and slabs, and the rest is machinery. It's crazy. It's a uh, it's uh, uh, interesting uh, to train your mind and uh, and your computers. And then we have, of course, these complex models. What I think is most important and the biggest uh, achievement in that context is that there is still a very clear order. And I believe in. Uh, I hope it's not built, but I hope yet. I hope in the end. The clarity of the plan, the simplicity of the urban figure will help the acceptance of such a place and also the livability over a long time because the interior will change. Of course, our model also shows then the courtyard with greenery and, and we are now elaborating on materials even in the emergency rooms that there is a quality that goes beyond what you expect when you go into a model. And again, then the facade develops into a tectonic system that is actually sun protection the technical layers of which i cannot speak now here but you see solar panels shading and even the reuse of stone that we take from the previous site is somehow brought to that facade so it again it's about its symbolic aesthetical meaning and about its technical technical um, performance so that's a current more or less current and sketch of the hospital in Barcelona, and that has been said in the beginning, so I cannot not show it. Uh, it's on the right, the Richard Meyer building, a beautiful plaza that is heavily used by skateboarders and tourists. And on the, on the left, we see a 15th century chapel. And where the red people are is the extension. It's a sort of a new face to the square and also to the Richard Meyer building opposite. In plan, you can maybe recognize here is the Richard Meyer, and there is the new, and here is the new building. It's the old chapel, the old convent, and then a new, there where the square is now, I don't see it on my screen. There is actually a new exhibition building. Renderings from the competition, they show these different fragments in time. It was heavily rebuilt in the 1980s. And uh, we are um, sort of proposing a new screen in front of that ensemble with the box in the back that you see, which is the exhibition um, venue. And I think this is maybe the most important in terms of typology. The Maya building, sorry, I, the Maya building has its main ramp. Uh, so it's here is the main circulation in the Maya building. And here is the main circulation then uh, and entrance in the new building with a stair on, on that side. So the two is really, it's a, a sort of a variation. And you see that this screen here, you see the different layers. We enter the historic church. These are the moments that we try to create um, um, on that very small site. So 
again, it's almost celebrating in this case the historic fabric and the different layers of that urban context. An important, an important remark, I shouldn't forget it, it's a collaboration with H Architects, so we are co-authors in that specific project where our typological and architectonical interests and also experience met in a quite beautiful way, I think, and we are uh, in enjoying the elaboration of the project and construction actually starts this fall if everything goes to plan, which is um, a bit different from Cologne, I must say. Um, uh, and uh, in section, we see then again this gallery or arcade to the left that is related to the square. Underneath is a big parking that potentially becomes part of the museum as well. And the three levels of exhibition floors, very experimental format here. So it's not this conventional museum. It's more a public venue that is really related to the interaction with the public space. And that's the top floor. And this is the last. I must show it because it's on the poster. It's on the poster. It's a temporary project for an art fair for Alt Paris International is a sort of a site format and it and we were invited to do a temporary installation for five days. So it cannot be that long. Um, but still, even this is an urban project for us. It is in a, a in a building on Boulevard des Capucines. It, it was only once and next time it will be in a different location. You see the opera by Garnier. It's the most beautiful site in Paris. The building is super important in history. Nadar, the famous photographer, had his atelier. Le Salon des Impressionistes was for the first time in this building. The building is a nightmare. It's a late 80s, early 90s um, um, office building stripped down. So sort of the structure stays, but the interiors are gone. It's 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 quite a and it and it, Zwischennutzung. I mean, it's a typical fancy hipster thing, but still it's nice. And we and the, and you see it here. Here is the building. And the project is stupid, but it's actually quite beautiful. The boulevard is the main orientation. I spoke an hour and 15 minutes ago, I spoke at the Kunstmuseum and how the urban figure is informing the plan. It's the same here. You see these lines, that's the plaster chips and board walls that we were introducing and the light fittings parallel to that. And they are parallel to the main boulevard, to the main facade. And then they collide with the rest of the building. So it's not not a great invention but it worked quite well it's a, actually a open a open meandering plan you follow the facade of the existing building and you and the galleries it's a commercial show as a commercial temporary museum and it worked in a quite beautiful manner this is the upper floor there was a small pop-up restaurant and then in the in the lower in the lower floor that's um it was only half of it because i think half is rented however we made a model where you see now the white walls this is the project but this is the art space that is ultimately uh, 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 as we try to believe um, also dedicated to the beautiful urban condition of a city like paris in this case and then here you see, uh, it was the first light, um, um, how to say, signage. Nada in Paris invented that, and we did it again, the Paris International. And we made some Donald Chart furniture, but we put the white dots on it, because the white dots in the back, they're all the remains of the glue or the plaster or the something that where the plaster boards were fixed to the wall. So you have these strange white dots everywhere, and we thought it was interesting to even use that context for our temporary furniture design. Um, I think the furniture is not existent anymore, as are the plasterboards. So that's then the typological invention is that there is a collision between two systems. And I, ultimately, that's what we are best at. We are not real designers, maybe, but we try to understand the rules of the city and make our architecture out of it, whether it's for art or for people or for plants. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you so much. You're very, very welcome. I will immediately.
go into the second part of the evening, which is the discussion. And it will start, I believe, with Michael from our first year. And I will just hand over the microphone for the first question. And maybe in the meantime, we can find the light switch. Um, yeah, so um, if it's okay, I'm gonna like ask a question a little bit about like a different direction. So we spoke all the time about European cities and I'm really interested in your project that it's not really about e Europe. It's like uh, about a project for um, architectural Biennale in Venice for uh, Uzbekistan, because I'm also like, I'm, I grew up in Kazakhstan, so like not so far from it. I'm familiar with the theme of your project with uh, Mahala, what you like uh, explored there. Like, I think it's pretty huge theme, but it's, if it's like, okay for you to like speak a, li a little bit about it, like right now, so like uh, speaking about like European city and so on, like um, what you what do you see like in this type of uh, co-living like uh, from for you like for as an European and like um, which in which context do you see it like in Europe? Do you see like any connections here? Do do you see like any way of using like that experience like after your like exploration and so on? And also like what what actually like for did you find interesting in that thing and also like and so on and how it's, it's like how do you see it like in European context yes yeah, right. um, okay Th thanks for, for your question first I mean it fits perfectly in the in, in into the story uh, but in order to keep it somehow limited I didn't introduce it right away but you're asking now because I was at the beginning sharing with you some of this so-called typological research Descri discovering describing urban urban structures buildings uh, in in different places of the world but as i also said somehow related to the western to west, somehow western modernity right and uh, uh, three years ago we somehow added the new chapter to this research and this is uh, still very recent and we are still also working on it somehow we were invited to uzbekistan which is central asia which is indeed a different context i mean there is as probably everywhere related to colonialism via russia there is also something like european architecture maybe but there is also a traditional way of building the city which is called mahala so it's a in simple words a low dense uh, uh, low rise high density structure courtyards courtyard patterns it's not informal settlement but it's vernacular and some of it is more designed than and some less and we were invited for a to do a project actually a transformation for an art center and then somehow we decided not to do that but we found this this um, vernacular traditional neighborhoods and we're interested in looking at them and out of that came a project for the Venice Biennale for Uzbekistan which we it was an academic project we did so there's no project project it is a, it's a research project we did with ETH and then we made a contribution to the to the pavilion uh, to the to Venice Biennale two years ago and it's not only interesting because it's maybe different from what most of us uh, are familiar with it is also interesting and we are not the first ones to look at it, even during the modern period. These also in other um, Islamic countries, you would find similar structures that then also led to European modern design of carpet cities. But we found a very interesting, not only typological, but, so, but also functional pattern that is integrating nature on a small scale, even partly still um, production um, of food, also crops and, and crops and, and 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 animals. So we called it the the urban rural or the rural urban um, fabric, and uh, related to some issues of climate, for instance, and ideas of maybe rethinking some of our city fabric in general. All of a sudden, such a traditional pattern can become very relevant. So we believe it's not necessarily the model that would be too easy. Architects often have the tendency to say, "Haha." I now found this and this is now our recipe. This is not the case, but I think it's a it's a contribution to the international debate and that's why we did it. And we are trying to integrate it into that typological survey. I'm sorry, I have to follow up with a second question in our, uh, from our first year. 
she unfortunately cannot be here, it's from Elizabeth, but she texted me and so I'm going to read it out, which by the way, of course, you can do in the YouTube live chat as well. Um, so I was asked to ask you, uh, since you've been uh, teaching for so many years and in so many different places, what do you think has changed in teaching architecture ever since you began teaching and or since you were a student yourself? Okay. Uh, uh, I, perhaps somehow everything has changed and then to a certain extent sometimes I think nothing has changed and this is a bit uh, maybe stupid answer and to, but to a certain extent I, I think it's true. What has changed and there I believe it's at least my experience and I, I'm sure it's similar here it's um, there is a, a level of political awareness that uh, I, I sensed less when I was a student and also maybe 10-15 years ago so that and I'm glad about about this development. I'm saying it's not changing necessarily because there is also we're moving forward, but still turning in circles, which is also nice. No, that uh, that there is maybe a form of political practice or or academic agency that is something that maybe my parents would have experienced in a different way. Yeah? Different again, the world was completely different, but there is now uh, a, a political space being created in the universities that that I didn't experience like that and that's f fundamentally different and with that comes an understanding that form making designing architecture is a political act always always and then sometimes we have interesting questions or discussions also with, with our students in Zurich for instance or in the US is still when we are ultimately coming to that moment where it's about let's say drawing a plan or maybe building a model or trying to take position about how what material to use and how to put these things together that then i'm confronted with the question but you know what is the political relevance of that and why are we debating the propo i mean slightly simplifying forgive me but why are we debating the proportion of a window while maybe people are in need of of uh, of urgent supplies and shelter you know and uh, and you architects we architects are caring about the color of i don't know <laughs> the entrance door and 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 then to understand myself huh? i'm not saying I, that i know but understanding ourselves again and again why we still believe it matters that we are careful with what we're doing and that we have this naive but I believe it is a, it is a still a still the naive uh, um, hope, and I believe it's still important that we have it that the things we're doing that they last. This is the most dramatic thing with architecture. It is it is outreaching what we can actually really control as a generation, and therefore that we care is important. And I see that as a form of political agency. But of course, we have to be critical and we have to be very analytical also. And this is something that is maybe more important or clearly more important than when I was a student or also 15, 10, 15 years ago. Authorship is completely put into question. And that's interesting too that designing is more about negotiating. Thank you. But I guess it's the same here, no? Okay, thank, thank you for your, for your lecture first. Um, I have a question, it might be a bit technical, um, but you were talking a lot about uh, tradition and heritage and um, even about tectonic um, aesthetics uh, in the facades. So this is quite a complicated um, issue nowadays with the isolations and all those topics. Um, I was wondering, uh, as you had a couple of buildings uh, which were uh, with the concrete structure, but uh, with the brick facade, when you were um, doing openings in the brick facade, you were not always uh, using traditional uh, brick support systems. And my question is, if this is uh, done on purpose uh, to place yourself in kind of a, a tradition of um, covering the supporting structure with a more valuable material or more, more um, um, let's say, yeah, more beautiful material, precious material. Um, and if this is done on purpose uh, and what your take is on how how the, the the future of showing tectonics in the facade might be so how can we solve this problem of having like 25 layers of uh, isolation and 
other things. Um, I mean, you, you, you gave a precise uh, critical description also of what's at stake. Uh, first, yes, I'm referring to tradition, but I would like to use your, your question also to make again the point that I think uh, tradition, the way I try to understand this, is a very, is a very um, um, vital and actually dynamic concept. And so I think tradition, the way uh, I think we architects are all, in a way or another, also um, caught within that system of handing down knowledge and 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 relating constantly to things that are already there. But we should see it. As a as a as a great as a as a great um, uh, benefit on the one hand, but also as an obligation to to always confront it with innovation. So tra for me, tradition is a is a concept of of change and transformation. Huh? And coming to the brickwork, um, maybe for that very reason, the quest the, the simple answer to your question is yes, everything is on purpose and consciously done. Whether it's good or bad, it's a different question. But for example, that we were then not expressing the lintel. Yeah, in some in some of the facades, it's also not a very easy decision. But that there is this ambiguity, or you could also say that moment of fakeness in the construction that is not anymore the traditional image. Actually, Barcelona will be traditionally built. Huh? It's a industrially, it's industrial materials, it's cheap bricks, and it's very crafted. And in that sense, the tectonics is what you see. Kunstmuseum is like a garment or a cloth. It is like it's like a um, wrapped by bricks. It's monolithic, but it's a layer that is suspended also. Eh? So the engineering behind is a completely different one. And that's what we, we wanted to make that somehow intuitively clear, whether this helps now the understanding. And we didn't so much think of that tradition of cladding, let's say, a brick structure with a marble uh, um, skin or envelope. But of course, it is somehow going back to this. Uh, absolutely. And somehow I like that whatever we think of our buildings, what they should do and not do, in the end, we have to find answers to this type of questions as well, no? Yeah. Hello, thanks for the lecture. It was very inspiring. Um, I wanted to ask about uh, the relationship of something that we can say maybe metaphysical quality of architecture to your work, because I had a feeling you were talking a lot about construction and materials and the way how we build, which is surely important. Um, but I felt, even though I, I know I know your work, also I've been to some of the buildings, and I know that there is this metaphysical quality in the sense that architecture and space definitely touches our soul. But I didn't feel you were talking about it enough. Um, why? <laughs> why I didn't talk about it all? Yeah. But, okay. Um... Perhaps the argument is is less is less um, easy to to transmit or to convey. Um, I mean, first, I absolutely agree with you that there is what you call the metaphysical, or it, the emotional the emotional energy of uh, of architecture. And um, I indeed, I was I was maybe referring to notion of something that is partly emotional and partly not, but is that I was referring, speaking of the Linz, the chocolate factory, or also Kunstmuseum in a, in a smaller way, that the interior has a dimension or a quality for public space. So, and then you could also say, we relate that maybe even to uh, some notion of monumentality. And this definitely then is a moment where it touches your soul, perhaps, or at least your psyche and your physics in a, in a way that we understand that the space is not just following an economical rule or, or fulfill, fulfilling a, a functional requirement. That the space has a reason to be that goes somehow beyond or beside that. And this is a very strong, and I'm very grateful for your comment with, slash question that uh, whether it's Landesmuseum that I didn't show today, um, 
because it has a bit of different or, or is another level of, of complexity of the old and the new. But however, Landis Museum, the dramatic stairs, the, the express the expressive space of the central in Kunstmuseum Basel or or this atrium in the in the in the chocolate box. <laughs> uh, but also small, smaller moments, no? even sm small when when a, when an angle turns, actually the housing, I don't know whether you remember the housing with the zigzag, right? I mean, there, this is a high degree of expressionist power that is in the apartment. And maybe it's even the best, the best example. And I'm really sorry that I didn't stress it because I've, I, as you could feel, I was feeling a bit, I have to come to through the whole slide. So that's maybe stupid, but that's the first, it's the first lecture in a long time. So I wanted to show everything, um, but, um, but because these apartments, of course, they, it, they 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 fit perfectly, you know the size that then the Wohnungsschlüssel and all the things and all the standards. But the promise or the bet in the project was to create spaces that are unseen. So every space is an individual thing, and of course this is a risky business, especially when it's a museum. You could say it's maybe less risky when it's a when it's a commercial housing. Then it's risky, you know, because people would reject maybe these spaces. Luckily. There is this, whether it's metaphysical or just an emotional t uh, moment when you enter these spaces and when you live these spaces is, is actually what makes them the quality ultimately, right? So it's true. I was maybe a bit uh, strongly insisting on the rules and the sort of the, 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 yeah, the declination of the different layers or levels. And it's true, no? But uh, I, I wouldn't reject that. I think. The metaphysical is part of architecture, even though what we control is the physical. Uh, so forgive me for having insisted on that uh, part. Can I also ask a question? Would that be okay? <laughs> okay. And um, then my question is, um, what role does a sense of humor play in your um, design process? Uh, a big one, a big one. I think a uh, sense of humor. And uh, But I believe... Uh, uh, sounds a bit heavier, but I think a work of architecture, a project, and the, at least when it's, get, when it's getting built, is actually always serious, you know? It's not deadly serious, it, it's not intimidatingly serious, but I don't believe we make jokes with architecture. This is just one disclaimer I would like to make. It sounds a bit like an old teacher, but really. But the sense of humor, to take yourself not too serious, yeah? first, that there is always an alternative to your strongest claim. That doesn't mean I don't have a position as a citizen, politically speaking, but that has maybe also to do that I work since the beginning with um, with Christoph Gantenbein. So the dialectics that what you are proposing and putting forward could be seen exactly the other way. This is just always an option. And 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 the sense of humor, in my understanding, is related to that. There is always an alternative to myself, right? And therefore, therefore, this is important. As a, and and we are having fun, and we are also, of course, and then and then, you have to be very frustrationstolerant as an architect, you know. So um, I mean, incredibly, incredibly tolerant to frustration. So one way of dealing with that is making fun of yourself and your clients and all the others, because otherwise you die and you simply die. Uh, so I don't know whether this is a precise answer to your question, but um, I, I find it's very serious what I'm saying and I mean it at the same time, at the same time, take it for what it is, but not for more than that. Uh, and that's also what I try to do because Otherwise, I think it's not possible to stay optimistic. And as architects, we have to be optimistic. And this is related optimism and, and maybe sense of humor. Otherwise, in our world, I don't know. I agree completely with you. I think it's a separate way to, to end this con this yeah, because, because being optimistic is the only way of really transmitting your 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 intentions in, into built forms at the end. Uh, optimism is absolutely, definitely important. <laughs> Even though in the difficult moments you have to keep this optimism, yeah? and you have transmitted it, I think during the whole lecture, yes, yes. and the critic before, yeah. yeah. So thank you very much thank you. for all this. Uh, um, <laughs>